Yeah, I think um, let's just start. If uh, someone is going to join, they will join automatically, I believe. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, so uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our very first lunch lecture of this year. I'm Cecilia from Student Team Footprint in Eindhoven. Uh, and today we are joined by the PD and software technology team that uh, collaborated with the European Space Agency. Um, as already mentioned by organizations such as Brainport Eindhoven and Bits and Chips, uh, ESA and the PDN uh, ST team developed an artificial intelligence system that can detect the emotions of astronauts and challenging deep space missions. Uh, so today the ST tra uh, trainees of the project uh, Astronaut Emotion Recognition, uh, as known as STERN, are going to introduce you to the projects, uh, the machine learning models, um, and any challenges they had during uh, the duration of the projects. Uh, and, and at the end, we have a Q&A session for any burning questions you have for the team. Uh, so today our presenters are Juan, Christopher, Luis, and Jusriu. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to give the floor to the ST team to present their STERN project. Um, have fun, everyone. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Juan. I was the project manager for this project. And today we're going to uh, tell you about our findings uh, in our project. As Cecilia already introduced, the project is named the Astronaut Emotion Recognition, which we, uh, which we abbreviated to STERN, and it's a collaboration with the European Space Agency. Let's see if I can control the slides. Yes, I can. All right, For so what are we going to talk about today? First, I'll give a short introduction on who we actually are. Uh, then I'll state the problem. Uh, we'll give a global architecture view. So how does the whole system look like? Whoa. Uh, then we'll go into our video detection architecture with an appropriate demo. Uh, then we'll go into the audio architecture with a demo. Uh, then we'll show how we did verification and validation on our AI models. That's a very interesting part. Uh, and we'll give some conclusions about everything in the project. So first of all, who are we? Like our, is already mentioned, we are the PDN software technology. And even though I think there are mostly TUEers in here, uh, the PDN is not that well known uh, among everyone. So what you have normally is a Bachelor of Science after which you do a Master of Science. And after your Master of Science, you can do a Postmaster. And these are mostly on the doctorate level. Well, the one everyone knows is the Doctor of Philosophy, which is a PhD. It's a track that takes four years and which is mostly research-based. And we are the PDN, which is a professional doctorate in engineering, which is a two-year track and it's really based on uh, designing software uh, and engineering and hands-on work. So this is who we are. And if we compare the two, the PDN compared to the PhD, uh, we like to place ourselves on, on, on this graphic, uh, more to the pragmatic and to the application-oriented side. This is because we do a lot of projects <coughs> on top of some courses. Uh, where uh, we work together with uh, large companies, large organizations, but also smaller companies. And uh, we do very interesting projects uh, on new technologies. And uh, this project uh, is an example of that. Uh, we got the opportunity to work together with a large organization like ESA uh, to work on something very new, very innovative. So that's, uh, that's it about us. Uh, let's talk about the project for a bit. So what is the problem that we're actually solving? Well, first of all, um, we were talking with astronauts, right? Uh, we are working together with the European Space Agency and there are a lot of astronauts working there and they are uh, focusing right now on deep space missions. What you see with these astronauts is that they are often in a stressful environment. They don't do these trainings for nothing, right? They are constantly under pressure and they must constantly perform at their highest possible potential. Additionally to that, especially in deep space missions, these astronauts are often far away. So the communication methods are not really there and assessing an astronaut's emotional state, is very, per uh, very difficult in person. And when they're often stressed, we can't really ask them about it or, or help them from distance. 
So Asa took these two problems and came to an idea of building a emotion recognition system to at least tackle the part where we can detect how an uh, astronaut is feeling in these stressful situations. When is an astronaut stressed? When is he feeling calm? And when does he have certain emotions? Well, this is what our project was based upon. So we were solving uh, the problem uh, of an emotion recognition system. Well, this came with some challenges, of course. Uh, the first challenge is that for us, this is quite a new domain. We are the PDN software technology. And although we uh, do have trainees from different disciplines, uh, of the 18 people that worked on this project, only two of them were artificial intelligence uh, majors in their masters. And the rest of us are mainly software developers or software engineers. So for most of us, this was a very new domain, which is the first challenge that we faced. The second one is that we are dealing with limited resources. And let me tell you why. Uh, if we're going to deploy these models in spacecraft, but, which is eventually where we're going to deploy them in, we don't really have a lot of resources. We can't place large computers in there. Uh, we don't really have unlimited resources there. So to emulate this in our project, we uh, limited ourselves to using a Raspberry Pi to uh, deploy and run these models on. And if they're uh, deployable and runnable on something like a Raspberry Pi, we can assume that eventually it can also be done on limited resources in the spacecraft. Another challenge is that we are dealing with short time in our project. The PDN is a pretty, uh, pretty intense program. So we have short-term projects where we do a lot of work. Um, so we worked on this project for 10 weeks, but uh, actually since there are also a lot of other responsibilities within the PDN, uh, these 10 weeks uh, tend to become something like seven and a half weeks. So we're dealing with a short time. Further, we have to use open source data sets and software, which is a requirement by ASA. They're an organization, they're trying to go open source. And while you would think this is obviously an advantage because we can publish what we did, uh, we do have to deal with licensing and uh, we do have to be careful about which data that we actually use. And then the last challenge to which I think everyone can relate a bit is remote working due to, uh, due to the pandemic. This project was, I think, around four or five months ago now. So we were fully in lockdown and we had to work fully online. I think we managed pretty well. Uh, we did uh, daily stand-ups at nine, such that everyone was there and we acted professionally in that. And I think that's also uh, why this project was successful. Um, but we, uh, this is a challenge that we had to work during the pandemic. All right, that's the that's the start of um, yeah, that's the start of, of our project. Now I want to give the word to Chris, who's going to talk about the technology stack and give a global architecture view. The floor is yours, Chris. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so uh, since we have some different uh, people here that are familiar with machine learning and artificial intelligence, it made sense to tell you about our technology stack. So we are using TensorFlow for uh, computer vision related things, mostly. Uh, it's familiar with it, uh, object, recommend, uh, object recognition and detection and things like this, and, and also classification. Uh, Python is our programming language. It's nice for doing quick prototyping. It's also well known in the machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, domain for deploying and developing models. OpenCV is also used for uh, computer vision and it's open source, of course. Librosa is used for audio analysis and doing different types of uh, analyses on your frequency components. OpenVINO is actually from Intel. It's an optimization framework. So the idea is if you package your machine learning models a certain way, you can optimize them and deploy them using OpenVINO. And then finally, we have DLib, which is usually used for things like uh, facial recognition. You could use uh, other algorithms with it, but that's primarily what we use to so our training environment, you might also be interested in where did we train these things? So on one hand, we used our personal computers. We can develop our Python code there or use Jupyter Notebooks so that we can run our little modules and do local testing. So this is before we tried to do anything on the Raspberry Pi, we wanted to test it. Does it work on our computer? Uh, being at the TUE, we also have access to a high performance computing cluster. So we had access to two uh, Tesla V100s that we could uh, interface with or if we want to do some processing really quickly, uh, we can interface directly with that. 
And then we also use Google Collab. If you're not familiar with this, it's basically like Jupyter Notebooks or Python modules in the cloud. So if you have a you have your notebook and you want to interact with a cell, it will be updated and you can share this with your colleagues. So it's really great for collaborative work. Okay, so what are our global architecture goals, right? Uh, the problem is that we want to develop an emotion recognition system. So on one hand, this needs to be a system that can easily detect the emotions. And the system also has to be able to recognize these, the, the astronaut's emotional state based on some type of input, right? We're, we're in space, it's far away. We can't call them and talk to them. So the best way we found to do this was based on video. So our faces, right, our movements. And audio, you can hear me, uh, I sound happy, or I don't sound happy, things like this. All within keeping in mind that we have these challenges. For most of us, it was a new domain. Uh, we have this Raspberry Pi, right? Which any type of an embedded system brings a lot of additional challenges, uh, especially for getting things just to work. And the short time and everything needs to be open. So as you saw before, things like DLib and OpenCV, of course, they're open source. And uh, every, every type of, even the data set we need to use need to be open source. So what do we want to do? Well, on one hand, we have the video input. And on the other hand, we have an audio input. And these are gonna be two different pipelines running in parallel, but in kind of like two different projects running in parallel, but essentially they need to be combined. So we start with the data set, and then from a different data set, maybe we have some data sets for video, we have some for audio, we need to do some data wrangling. And data wrangling is kind of, you can also consider it like pre-processing. We need to manipulate our data in a certain way. We need to ingest our data into the environment we're working in, play with it a little bit, and then develop some AI models, right? That will be able to do the prediction and uh, recognition that we want. So let's start with the data set. Might be quite interesting for you. So how do you how do you split your data? Uh, for now, we'll just say we have a proper data set, uh, and this is a, a everybody agrees in the in the academic world that this is an okay data set to start with. But we have to figure out how to split it. So a common way to do this is you take, for example, we have twenty four actors, twenty four people, and they actually are actors in this case, and you can take eighty percent of the information from each one of these actors, and set this as your training set. And then you can you put the rest in your validation and testing sets, right? So 80%, majority of the data of an actor goes into training set, and then the rest goes into your validation and verification. Um, but if you're testing, how to say, if you're testing your, your results, your models on training data that the model has already seen the actor before, uh, you can have some problems. Like it's not, it will, it will give you good accuracy or better accuracy than you would, would expect on a new image of the actor, but it's not very realistic because one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna take this model that we've developed, we wanna show it a completely new individual, which is the astronaut, right? And for, uh, just for your note, the astronaut is not wearing the helmet when we're doing this type of process. They're usually sitting in the International Space Station or a space module and they're completing some task while you can see their face. Okay, so then how should we split the data set? Actually, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 80% of the total data from the actors. So this is the first 20 actors. We're gonna train it on them. And then two actors, we're gonna do validation set and two actors, we're gonna do testing set. So these actors are new. Uh, it's not as common approach historically in machine learning. It's becoming more popular. And this will result in much better or much more accurate example of our use case where we have a new astronaut who the model has never seen before, and we want to detect, is he happy? Is he sad? Is he okay? Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna do, or that's what we did. Okay, remember data wrangling? Okay, so what does this mean? First, we're gonna take and do something called data segmentation, right? So this is a, a, maybe a little abstract, but the idea is we're gonna break our different data into its types. So we have audio data, we have visual data, and we're gonna split it like that. Then we're gonna do some pre-processing, and this is running in parallel. We need to do it for each of these types of data. We start with data cleaning, make sure that nothing is missing. We don't have any random uh, zeros or something, or the frequency component's not there. Data integration, we might have multiple data sets for the same type of 
process. So we might have two or three audio data sets that we want to combine. Data transformation. So this is things like normalization and trying to make sure that our data is in the right, uh, all the data is in the same structure. And data reduction is say, we want to remove some labels or we want to remove data that we don't think is necessary. Uh, as you saw before, uh, we actually looked at maybe like five emotions, but there's more than five emotions and the data sets have more than five emotions, some of them, and we want to make it consistent. So remove the emotions that we think will be problematic or don't, or they're not helpful. Then we do our data splitting. So we split into the, our, our, our testing, our training, and our validation sets. And that's basically the high level, what we do in the data wrangling. Probably not new for uh, people with an artificial intelligence background. Similarly, not new, uh, we have our AI modeling, right? So this, now that our wrangling is done, our pre-processing is done, we're gonna split our, our data. We have our testing set and our validation set. We put them kind of together and we have our training set. So from our training set at the bottom of the screen, uh, we need to do some model engineering or feature engineering. This is where we're actually gonna start to put our algorithms and actually try to figure out uh, what's the feature importance of a certain aspect of the model. Then this needs to have some uh, evaluation. How do we know what's good? Of course, uh, an easy target to start with is accuracy. See if we get some type of accuracy, but that's not really, uh, accuracy is not always useful in machine learning. So we look at things like F1 score, and if uh, our results are not good, we're going to go back to the model engineering. So do some more hyper uh, hyperparameter tuning, things like this. If everything is good, we can move on to model packaging. So this is actually making sure that our output of our model is in a proper format that can be used by the Raspberry Pi or the optimizer. In our case, we're using OpenVINO. So we need to make sure that the packaging format is in the proper uh, format to be optimized and deployed. But once it's been optimized, we send it back to packaging, make sure it's good again, and then we're ready to deploy it effectively. But we'll get more about, we'll get more to deploying in a little bit. So on a high level, we have a video architecture and an audio architecture. We're gonna do pre-processing, we're gonna do some modeling, and then later on, we're gonna deploy. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to my wonderful colleague, Yusril, who's gonna talk about And you sure we can't hear you. You sure? Can anyone else hear him? One? Yeah. Hello? Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. There was a technical issue somehow. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And now I'm going to um, request the remote control again. Okay, and now uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. So I'm going to explain more about the video module. And I'm Yusriel, and uh, I'm I was the uh, software architect of the video module team. Now, um, start from the data set. Um, in video module, we have two public data sets. The first one is uh, rough desk and the second one is crema d for rough desk um, it contains 24 actors with 12 female and 12 male and for uh, crema d it contains 91 actors uh, with 43 female and 48 uh, male from each data set we took only the um, uh, the one that we need uh, the emotion that we need which are neutral, happy, sad, angry, and fearful. And let's go to the data wrangling in video module. So uh, the, in general, there are uh, three, uh, sorry, six steps. Um, and then it starts from the, the video or the live streaming. And then we extract uh, it into, uh, into a sequence of uh, images, or we, call, we also call it the frames. And then after that, we detect the face part and then align the face. And after that, uh, we extract the special, special part of the uh, face. And then um, in the end, we normalize it into gray color and also 32 by 32 pixels. 
Uh, this is also uh, the benefit of uh, resizing into small pixel so that uh, we can predict, uh, we can improve the prediction time since we are going to also deploy it in Raspberry Pi. In the modeling part, uh, initially we had two options. The first one was 2 uh, uh, using 2D CNN architecture, and the second one was using 3D CNN. For 2D CNN, um, it expects a single image as an input, and then we tried uh, some best practices there, um, like Google Net, Alexa, TerraSnet 50, and Mobile Net V2. And in the end, uh, we found that the one that has the best accuracy and prediction time was a mobile net v2 and when we saw the intention of this uh, architecture it was also uh, it was also built for hd files uh, so in this case um, raspberry pi so i uh, we took this architecture as our representative for 3d cnn for 3d cnn it expects a sequence of images as an input however there are not uh, at least there was not many best practice architectures uh, that adopt uh, 3d cnn so if we want to go with this one, uh, then we have to invent uh, our own architecture uh, for 3D CNN. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, I just want to show you briefly uh, what the difference between 3D CNN and mobile that we do, uh, the one that uh, we used in this project. As you can see that uh, the layers uh, is less for the 3D CNN uh, we, since we also built it uh, according to the needs of this project, different than mobile net v2, where um, uh, it is a best practice, so it, it has a general purpose uh, intention there. So uh, after we tested uh, them, and uh, this is the result, in y-axis it shows the pre-processing process, and then in the uh, y-axis it shows the accuracy value. As you can see here that um, 3D CNN shows um, a better result in terms of the accuracy than uh, mobile net V2. And uh, um, another thing that, I, that we can get from this graph is that uh, the more you add the pre-processing step, uh, the better the accuracy become. But again, uh, related to the pre-processing pre step, there is a threat of there because the more we add um, pre-processing step, uh, the worse the prediction time become. So um, yeah, um, we have to also uh, take that into account since uh, we're going to deploy it in Raspberry Pi. So based on our investigation, this is the threat of uh, metrics. And for prediction time, uh, mobile net V2, as the advantage here. And then uh, in terms of the development time, mobile net V2 also has the advantage since it is a best practice and then we didn't need to invent our own uh, architecture. And for the accuracy, as we just saw that um, tradition and has better accuracy. Um, in terms of the input, uh, tradition and has the benefit here since uh, we are going to uh, predict the emotion from the live streaming or a recorded video. That's why a uh, video as an input becomes um, also a plus for 3D CNN. And for the model size, um, 3D CNN uh, had, has a smaller, in, in our project has smaller uh, size. We have to take into account the model size also since we are going to deploy it in Raspberry Pi where we have limited uh, uh, storage size there. And why it is a plus here? Because we tailored our 3D CNN according to our needs. So we don't have a big uh, layers there. Uh, different than mobile net V2 where it is a best practice. So it has general purpose. And it turns out it has more layers. So for the prediction time, uh, we didn't consider that in, as a disadvantage anymore since we optimize it using OpenPino and also the compute engine. As you can see from the number, it became faster after we optimize it. So that's all from uh, video module. And now we are going to show you a demo, a short demo. 
In this video, we are going to show how to configure the system, how to run the system, and how the system shows the prediction results. Welcome to the demonstration of the video-based emotion recognition module. In this video, we will show you how you can use the Stern video tool to predict emotions based on facial expressions. To run the code, we must first modify the configuration file, which is used to set dynamic parameters. Some of the important parameters are the model type, is Raspberry Pi camera, and input type. Using the model type parameter, you can choose between CNN and 3D CNN. Currently, it is set to 3D CNN. To run it on the Raspberry Pi, set the is Raspberry Pi camera to true. It is set to false as I am currently running it on my laptop. To use the camera as input, set the input type to camera, or set it to video if you wish to use a pre-recorded video. I will demonstrate using both. We will now watch the video we will use as input. As you can see, she looks happy. Let's see what the tool thinks. We will now run the tool using this as the input video. As you can see, the tool too believes she is happy with a probability of 0.99 for happy. You can also see the other emotions and their probabilities. We will now run the tool using the laptop camera. To do this, we would first have to edit the configuration file and set the input type to camera. Let us now run the tool At the top left of the screen, you will see a histogram that represents each emotion's probability. As you can see, I look happy and the tool has predicted the same. I will now change my facial expression. The tool will now use this expression as input. The tool now predicts I am sad and fearful. The prediction is also printed on the terminal. This brings us to the end of our demonstration. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's all. Uh, that's all from a video module. Now I'm going to head it over to my colleague, Luis, for audio. Thank you, Yuri. I think I have control now. So hello, everyone. I'm Luis Romabarge. I was the software architect of the audio team. And I'm going to explain the audio pipeline that we developed. First, I'm going to start explaining the data set that we use. Then I will proceed to explain the, how we use the data wrangling in the audio model. And finally, I will show the AI models that we produce. So in the audio team, we decided to develop two different models, one from the tone and one from the text. This is because what you say is uh, there is infor a emotional information in what you say and how do you say it. So we have two models. For the tone model, we train with the Raptors data set, just like the video team. But we also decided to use the test data set. This is a Canadian data set with 200 examples performed by two different actors. For the text model, we decided to train with Mel, ICR, and Tweet data set. This is because there is no, there is only two sentences available in the Raptors dataset, so a, a motion model based on text cannot be trained. After some weeks of work, uh, we observed that we were not obtaining uh, promising results with the text model, and and basically it was failing to detect emotion from plain text. If you think about this, this makes sense because when you receive a message or an email. It's difficult to understand the emotions behind of the person writing it. So from that moment, we decided to focus only in the tone data set, in the tone model. And these are the five emotions that we got, that we want to detect. Okay, but how do you train a deep learning model based on sound? So uh, after researching for some weeks, we, we found out that the the 
what people use is the are the male frequency septal coefficients and i'm going to explain how we obtain those so you take an audio signal uh, and you perform what is a duration equalization basically we add silence at the beginning of each training example so all of them uh, have the same duration after this we perform a fast Fourier transform i'm not going to explain much about this but basically you take an audio input and you and you move, transform it from the uh, from the time domain into the frequency domain after this we further transform it into a male scale and we apply a logarithm here we uh, the, we obtain this uh, middle output that is called the log interbank energy and i will explain later on why we need this and if you apply another fast Fourier transform you obtain the male frequency septal coefficients these coefficients have all the phonemes and frequency uh, information for a zone. Now I'm going to explain uh, the two uh, AI models that we produce for ASA. This one is the first one, and it's, we call it the sequential model. This is a, a simple model that we developed in the first week while we were still in the, in the exploration phase and we were still learning about the technologies. So as you can see, this model has three groups of layers and each of these group has a convolutional one di dimension layer a batch normalization layer a dropout layer and a max pooling 1d and the input of this model is the mfcc that i previously mentioned and the output are predictions of these five emotions after we gained some knowledge and confidence we tried and implemented one model based on a state-of-the-art paper we call this model the Siamese model because it has two different two branches that are equal. On each of these branches, uh, similarly to the previous model, we have three groups of, of layers. And uh, in each of these groups, we have a, a convolution to the layer, a bus normalization, a spatial dropout to the, and a max pooling to the. The only difference between these branches is that one of it, uh, one of the branches uses the MFCCs and the other branches uses the log winter bank energy. Then we have a concatenation layer here that mixes the, the results. And again, with a dense layer, we obtain fine prediction. In this slide, you can see a briefly comparison between the models. So in terms of complexity, the sequential model is a, is a simpler model, and the Siamese model is a more complex one, state, based on a state-of-the-art paper. Since the Siamese model is more complex, it has more layers and more operations, so the prediction time is a bit longer than the sequential, but still, both of the prediction times are under a second. Uh, based in, the, based, in the base accuracy, Based on the text accuracy, the Siamese model has a better accuracy, reaching almost uh, 70%. And based on the input, the Siamese model uh, has two inputs, like, uh, as, as I mentioned. Uh, regarding the size, both of the models are almost equal, with the sequential model being a bit more small. Now that, that, now that I show the overview of the pipeline, I'm going to show another demo. This is how we use the audio demo. In this demo, we are going to show how we configure the system, how to run it, and how the system shows the prediction result. On a side note, the numbers that you will see are not the accuracy, but the confidence values. Welcome to the demonstration of the audio-based emotional recognition module. In this video, we will show you how you can use the stern audio tool to predict the emotions based on the tone. As you can see, we use a configuration file to set the dynamic properties such as the model direction and model type. By using the command line and specifying the configuration file, we can start predicting. Normally, the tool uses the system's microphone, but now, for this demonstration, we are using two recorded audio. Stay away from me! As you heard, this audio represents fear. 
I told you, stay away from me. And this one is the angry one. Now we are going to run the script. It is also good to mention that this model is the Siamese model. Based on the results, the fearful audio contains 58% of fearful, 20% of sad, and 2% of neutral emotions. Also for the angry audio, the model recognized 60% of anger, 35% of fear, and 3% of happiness. In the next part, we will predict the audio files based on the sequential model. To work with the sequential model, we should change the model direction to refer to the sequential model directory and change the model type to sequential. After that, we run the model in command line again. This time, fearful audio results are 93% of fear, 4% of anger, and 2% of sadness. For the anger audio, we also have 95% of anger and 4% of happiness. Here you can see both results of Siamese model and sequential model together. Thank you for your attention. I hope you like the demo. Now I'm going to pass the word to my colleague, Chris. Can you, uh-oh, it broke. Can you hear me? Yes, but we can see the, the slide deck. Can you see the slide deck now? No, uh, we are, yeah, you are in presentation mode. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Zoom's having some trouble now, but I am back and to go back to talk about deployment, right? So earlier I told you we would, uh, we would get to that. So I'll briefly go over these steps. So now that our model has been made, we have our nice little astronaut on the left, bottom left, and some sensors are going to detect him. And this data wrangling step is actually going to happen again on the Raspberry Pi. So it's gonna do some pre-processing to get the data in the proper format. And then it's gonna run these different AI models and we're gonna get the different emotions as an output. So you already saw an example of a histogram where it shows the different uh, probabilities or the confidence of these emotions on the screen. And we're also gonna log this data. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit very briefly about verification and validation. So unfortunately today our test manager wasn't available uh, to join us because he has another meeting. So I'm gonna to try to cover his uh, information briefly, but I'm not the, the proper expert on this, okay? So from a testing perspective, we still have uh, two pipelines. We have a video system and an audio system. And we're gonna actually break these down into first where they're similar. They both need to be uh, fast and accurate in, in predicting. They need to display the results and they need to store the results. Where the systems vary is the video system, you need to do some detection and cropping of the face and make sure this is done correctly. The frames need to be generated from the video and then they need to be stored. So how often do they need, how many need to be stored? How often do they need, need to be taken? Things like this. From an audio perspective, we're gonna extract the frequency component and we need to uh, store this and, and be able to manipulate it later. Now, both of these systems have both what we call native components. These are your traditional software components and artificial intelligence components. So native components, they try to be, uh, they try to have specific requirements that we can verify, right? So if you run a Python module, uh, you should be able to get a certain output, but the AI components should have a certain accuracy or threshold or F1 score for the model candidates. We need to assess that. So native components, they follow these classical tests like unit tests and system tests as where the AI components, you're gonna look at things like the F1 score or the, the confidence value of your output. What we did not do in the project is we did not do integration tests for the IOU for AI components uh, due to the interest of time. Okay, so what technologies did we use? We use GitLab, which is of course a Git version control, uh, DVC, 
data version control for machine learning. It's usually used for machine learning data sets because you can store a lot of data there. Docker for containerizing and deploying our, our product. We created a, an additional pipeline that I'd like to briefly talk about. And of course, we use the Raspberry Pi and the TUE infrastructure, including um, the, the CICD, the continuous integration, continuous deployment, and continuous testing with the uh, things like the high performance cluster. So conditional pipelines, we have two. And basically, this means if something hasn't been, uh, doesn't pass a certain test, it will not move on to the next test and will throw some type of error or warning. So we can start with the native components. So for example, here we want to conform to PEP8. PEP8 is a, a standard for uh, uh, programming in Python. And if it doesn't meet, conform to this, if it doesn't conform to this, we should get an error. Additionally, we have things like unit tests where we're actually gonna evaluate does the, does the program, the functional requirements work the way we want. And similarly for smoke tests, we ask our, ourselves, does it actually deploy? Can we see the system? Can we hear the system? And we actually want to run these. And all of our requirements need to be verified and have traceability throughout the system. So this is a typical uh, system engineering approach where we want to make sure that every single requirement and test uh, every test that we write has a requirement and can be traced to some uh, functional or non-functional reason to be specified. Okay, so we have some AI components as well. This is probably one of the more interesting parts of the project. So I'm, I'm sorry that I won't be able to cover all the details very well, but first thing we need to do is fetch the data. So we do our data ingestion and make sure that it's actually, uh, it loads properly. We need to validate our data, make sure that the output of the format of this data is uh, in the proper form. It can interface with the other uh, software components within our testing environment or our, our modeling environment. Threshold validation means if we don't exceed, say, say you want an F1 score of 0.8 and you get an F1 score of 0.7, then it will automatically reject this and do some hyperparameter tuning so that you can uh, meet this threshold. And then of course we have the smoke test at the end but the smoke tests are just making sure that the output is uh, the way it looks. So some thresholds on the bottom left side, you can see this JSON file that actually shows the log data of the thresholds being met. And you can set that if the thresholds don't exceed a certain amount uh, or something doesn't make sense, then the output needs, you need to do it again. Uh, similarly, on the right side, you can see that we have some uh, different uh, threshold cases where we have accuracy or performance F1 score, and we actually want to test those and we want to do it relatively fast. And this can be used, or this is used in our continuous integration, uh, continuous testing pipeline. So whenever we push our code to the kit, it will check these things automatically. So we, this is during training and it's really quite nice, I think. Uh, so lastly, we have our smoke test. And uh, yeah, smoke. So the smoke test, sorry, the smoke test just actually checked to see does everything make sense? It's kind of a sanity check. Uh, are all of our components actually displaying the way we want? And does it make sense? Some of the novelties in here is that it's generic and configurable. This module is actually outside of the, of the Stern application, it means that you can change it to work with other embedded systems. It's extendable. So if you want to implement a different type of threshold or different type of interface requirement, you can. And then that allows us to use this in our other AI projects uh, whenever we want. This time, I will hand the floor back over to Juan and thank you for your attention. All right, so we're almost there. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up uh, our presentation um, with some findings. Uh, we have some findings on the video module. Uh, first of all, that it can, uh, emotion recognition on grayscale images actually gave us better results. And this was at first very surprising to us, uh, but after thinking some more about it, it, it kind of makes sense since you, um, you only focus on the really important information and for emotions, color is not really the most important information in the picture. Uh, and the second one is that emotion recognition on larger images, so higher resolution images, didn't necessarily give us better results. Then a finding on the audio part is dealing with different accents is very difficult in audio emoji recognition. Uh, we were quite limited in our audio data sets. Um, there are way more uh, things available for videos where actors really show emotions. So we had to produce some of the data ourselves, but we noticed we are a very diverse team 
uh, that dealing with these different uh, different accents is, is really difficult. Uh, and lastly, distribution of data sets is important for high fidelity approach. We mentioned the data set in the beginning. At first, we went with the, with the approach, which gave us a way better accuracy, but it didn't really represent the real world, right? We did testing and training on the same actor, which is not really what you would see in, uh, in the real world. We, we would have different kind of uh, astronauts actually using our system. And then finally, oh, whoops. That was one too far. Uh, as a summary, uh, we've developed uh, an extensible and modular AI pipeline. We've identified challenges and use cases for deep space. We have classified audio and video with a high fidelity approach. And we conform to all the ASA standards for documentation and modeling. So in my opinion, this is a successful product. Our client was very happy with the result. Uh, so we are also very happy. And then the last slide, I really want to thank some, uh, some people. I want to thank ASA for giving the opportunity to work together with them. Uh, I want to thank our, uh, our staff, mainly our program director, Janja Dajsuren. I know she's also uh, in the call right now. Uh, and I personally, as the project manager, want to thank the whole team. Uh, you can see all of us right here. Everyone did a great job in, in this project and couldn't have been done without any of these guys. So, uh, and obviously I want to thank you all for listening and we can move on to our questions. And I see we still have 10 minutes left, so uh, we can squeak in some, uh, some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Juan, Christopher, Luis, and you, Sue. Um, I believe I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but uh, if anyone has uh, uh, have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Wow, we were super clear, huh? <laughs> that was very clear. Um, is it, did you find uh, a correlation between the using of the uh, facial and the uh, audio together, or is it uh, standalone still applicable? So, uh, did you find that it works better if the audio and the data and the video recognition work together? Oh. So this is something that we intended to do in the beginning, which was a multimodal approach to where we could actually, uh, I mean, there's some, there is a correlation between my facial expression and my tone because they're coupled uh, when we communicate, but we actually did not evaluate this uh, at an integration level. So one of the things we didn't do is integrate because it turns out multimodal integration is kind of challenging and you set different weights for different things. The research we did read showed uh, indicated that a majority of your expression on the emotional level is due to facial expressions and not tone. It's also cultural. Uh, so we have a Russian colleague, and you couldn't really tell from his uh, voice his expression, but I'm American, so you can usually tell my mood based on my uh, voice. So we did this, to answer your question, we did it as a standalone or separate. They were not integrated. But uh, if they had been integrated, this also would have improved things like our confidence value. Uh, but designing these weights on how they should be integrated is a little bit challenging. And we unfortunately didn't have enough time to evaluate this on say something like our Raspberry Pi. All right, sure, add, that makes sense. Yeah, and to add on to Chris, um, we did deliver an approach to do this multimodal approach. And uh, we also gave some extra recommendations on using some other sensors uh, like heart rate sensors, or may, maybe even uh, measuring brain activity and using it in different AI models, where you can really get uh, more confident in your, your prediction. Yeah, but good comment. Um, maybe I... Uh, kind of a cultural factor where maybe uh, someone uh, has different facial expression based uh, on their culture because you know maybe emotion showing isn't a, a big deal um, and you have mentioned that uh, you had trouble with accents uh, is that something um, you can uh, fix with uh, uh, your, your model or is it uh, just uh, a thing that's unfixable just a variable there oh i can, I can answer this also uh, the short answer is, of course, we can fix this with our model. 
So on one hand, we wanted to create a generic approach that works for uh, any individual, right? Any new individual that comes in, any astronaut, we should be able to work with them. So on a generic level, we can at least kind of roughly classify, but the recommendation we would need to use later is we actually have our generic model, but we also need to make smaller submodels for uh, transfer learning. The idea there is uh, say you have a certain cultural background with facial expressions or your tone or accent, you should be able to generate or create um, and tune a model that meets this individual astronaut's requirement or individual and is personalized or customized based on the hyperparameter tuning related to their particular features. So you have a general model that does certain things and then for certain feature importance, which is a, a, entirely another project that we would like to do, but you classify the feature importance for certain things in this individual, use transfer learning to apply this back to your uh, primary model, and this will improve your results. Thank you. So it's very interesting. Uh, I think we have uh, a little time left. If anyone has some questions, now is uh, now's your chance. You can always contact us too. So if you're shy. Definitely. Uh, just send us a message. Also, uh, on a good note, um, if you like these kind of projects and you're almost finished with your master or if you're already finished with your master, um, the PDN is now accepting trainees for uh, the year 2021. So if you're a very, uh, very ambitious person and you like these kind of projects that you just saw, you can also always try to apply and uh, yeah, we're still open. Uh, maybe you can... Uh put your contacts info or some uh, websites where you can find more information in the chat. Uh, there's still some people left. Maybe if they're interested, uh, they can reach out to you. Uh, we've got a question from Nick in the chat. Uh, you notice that uh, you classified emotions into six categories. How did you decide how to classify other emotions into these six categories? There is a chance of overlap, right? Yeah. Of course. There, so first, of course, first, there's yeah. a chance of uh, overlap. Uh, we actually, there are more emotions and some of the data sets actually contain more emotions. And we chose not to use those to avoid this overlap. It turns out that emotions have a certain distance from each other, right? So happy and sad, you might think of them as a certain distance, but sad and angry also has another different distance. So it's not, it's not really two dimensional. So how did we pick them? We tried to use some intuition on which emotions are the most impactful, right? So what, what are the most dangerous emotions you can express during a space mission? So something like anger or sad. You don't want an astronaut way out in deep space to be um, not very happy, right? This is something we need to classify definitely. Um, uh, other ones like disgust, we didn't, well, do we really need this? Maybe in the future we do, but not for our prototyping and, and testing. So we tried to look at how impactful they would be for the high level mission and uh, why would we need to detect those? And then the ones that do overlap, if there is a really, we did part of this with testing. Uh, if it really recognized or got confused, the model got confused. If one of those emotions was not um, necessary, we would try to remove it to remove this overlap. So it's kind of cheating, but but not also, really. Uh, Chris, also add on to you, uh, we we did discuss. We we take you have to take into account who this ends up with, and we are doing this for astronauts and, and which emotions are most impactful for them. Uh, I can imagine if you take these kind of models and, and apply it to another field, that you maybe come up with different emotions that are important for that kind of field. So uh, the emotions were not really picked because the models work best for these emotions, but more for the use case where it's actually going to be used. Uh, and that's how we handpick them. Um, yeah, with, with the client. Yeah, with ESA. Yeah, okay. on a side note, uh, the original, uh, when, when we started, we use all the emotions that are available in the roughness data set. We, we decided to remove disgust, like as Chris said, and also calm because it has some overlap with neutral. And we also remove a uh, surprise, I think. Surprise, yeah. yeah. Yeah, even me as a human, I don't know the difference between calm and neutral, right? <laughs> so. Very true. Yeah, uh, emotions are hard. So uh, 
I believe this was a very successful uh, project, innovative and uh, great that it can also really be used by uh, European Space Agency. I uh, believe we are almost out of time. Uh, so I want to thank the PDN software technology team again for introducing us to such a successful AI project. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about them, I'm sure they are always free to ask, uh, answer any questions. I saw that they also put a link uh, to more information about the PDN program in the chat. Um, and if you're interested in Footprint AI, you can find more information on our website. Uh, you can find out more about our AI for Good projects, uh, where we apply AI to solve sustainable development goals. Um, and we're also always looking for new footprinters to join our team or our board for the next academic year. Uh, I will put a few links in the chats if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone, for joining and thank you for uh, the great presentation. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you.